Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the intermediate value theorem. And as we go through this, I'm going to draw a picture, picture for you of what's going on. Okay, so the first thing is that f is continuous on the interval between a and b. All right, well, a and b are x values. So I've got an interval along the x-axis between a and b, and the function f is continuous on this interval. And you can draw this any way that you want. It just needs to be continuous. All right, so I'm going to draw it just like this. And then k is any number between f of a and f of b. All right, well, this is where f of a is, and then f of b would be up here. And this theorem is saying that k is just anywhere in between f of a and f of b. Well, I'm going to put it right here. And if that's true, so if I have a continuous function between the x values a and b, and then I have a number k that's between f of a and f of b, so k, another way to think of it is that k is between the end point, the, k is a y value that's between the y values of the endpoints of this function, then I'm guaranteed that there's at least one number c between a and b, so they're talking about c being an x value, such that f of c equals k. So what they're saying is that if k is between f of a and f of b, then you're guaranteed that there's an x value between a and b such that f of c equals k. And I kind of call this the, well, duh theorem because it makes complete sense. You've probably never really thought about it, but it's a theorem and it is tested on the AP exam. One of the useful things of this theorem is that it can be used to locate the zeros of a function that is continuous on a closed interval. So if f is continuous between a and, a and b, again, and f of a and f of b differ in sign, okay, so that means that one's positive and one's negative, then the intermediate value theorem guarantees the existence of at least one zero on a to b. All right, so the reason that that works is that f of a and f of b differ in signs. So one's positive and one's negative. Well, zero is obviously in between a negative number and a positive number, so therefore you're guaranteed that somewhere between a and b there's an x value such that f of x equals zero. All right, so we're going to use the intermediate value theorem to show that f of x equals x cubed plus 2x minus 1 has a zero on the interval from zero to 1. And the way that you do that, the first thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that the function is continuous. And this is a polynomial function, and a polynomial function is continuous everywhere. But it only has to be continuous on the interval from 0 to 1. So because we're talking about the interval 0 to 1, I'm just going to write that f of x is continuous on 0 to 1. All right, now, the next thing is I need to find the y values of my two endpoints. And I'm always going to find those y values of my two endpoints any time I use the intermediate value theorem. So one endpoint is at x equals 0, so the y value would be f of 0. When I plug a 0 into x, I get negative 1. The other endpoint is at x equals 1. So f of 1 is 2. So because I have one endpoint that's negative and one endpoint that's positive for my y values, 0 obviously falls in between that. And the way that I want you to kind of summarize this is I want you to say because 0 is between f of 0 and f of 1, and the way that we write that mathematically is that f of 0 is less than 0 is less than f of 1. So because 0 is in between those two y values, there must be an x value between 0 and 1 
such that f of x equals 0. And that's the intermediate value theorem. It just says that wherever your endpoints are, you've got to find the two y values of those endpoints, and if there's a number that's between those two y values, then you're guaranteed a corresponding x value on that given interval. And it's, these problems are frustrating to some people because you're not really working anything out. You're just showing something. Um, you don't, you already have the answer. You're just kind of using the theorem to go through it step by step. Um, but that's what I would expect you to write. You need to find the y values of the two endpoints and then make your conclusion. Okay, on number two, verify that the intermediate value theorem applies to the interval and find the value of C that's guaranteed by the theorem. Okay, so this is asked, this is a little bit different, but the first thing we have to do is verify that we can apply the intermediate value theorem to this interval. All right, well, the first thing is that f of x needs to be continuous. f of x is not continuous everywhere. Um, it's glaringly not continu continuous at x equals one because there's a vertical asymptote there. However, our interval is only between five halves and four, or two and a half and four. So f of x is continuous on the interval that's been given to us. Okay, now we're looking for a value of c such that f of c equals six. So we need to continue to prove that I can apply the intermediate value theorem here. So I need to find the y values of my two endpoints. So I will need to find f of five halves. And to save time, I will tell you that that is 5.833. In calculus, we always round to three decimal places. And then the other endpoint is x equals four, and that corresponding y value would be f of four, and that value is 6.667. So, does the intermediate value theorem apply? Yes, because six is in between f of five halves and f of four. So six is between those two y values of those endpoints, and so therefore, I'm guaranteed that there's some value of x such that f of x is six. But the way I want you to write it is because six is between f of five halves and f of four, and the way you write that is f of five halves is less than six is less than f of four, there must be and f of x equal to six on the interval between five halves and four. So that whole part was just verifying that I could apply the intermediate value theorem to that function on that interval. All right, now it's asking me to actually find that value of c that's guaranteed by the theorem. Okay, well this goes back to algebra two. We just need to find the x value where f of x equals six. So I just set the function equal to six Since I have a fraction, here I can cross multiply. If you cross multiply, you get 6x minus 6 equals x squared plus x. And whenever you're trying to solve an equation that involves a quadratic, you want to bring everything over to one side. I'm going to bring everything over to the left. So when I subtract 6x from both sides, I get minus 5x and add 6 to both sides and I get plus 6 and that equals zero. And then we can factor, and it will factor into x minus three times x minus two. So x equals three and x equals two. Be careful about just boxing your answer and moving on. We're talking about a specific interval here, so we need to check to make sure that both these answers, or we only need to give answers that are in the interval. So it's between two and a half and four, so x equals two, does not work, so my answer is x equals three. And I would actually like to see this work right here. I'd like to see the x equals three and the x equals two to, to show, to see that you've considered all of it, and then the fact that you went back and rewrote x equals three and put a box around it 
um, tells me that you considered looking back at that interval. All right, last problem for about the mean value theorem. Um, and this is the way, this is an actual former AP problem. So this is kind of the way they really ask it on the AP exam. So the functions f and g are continuous. The table below gives the values of these functions at selected values of x. The function h of x equals f of g of x minus eight. Explain why there must be a value p for one less than p less than three, such that h of p equals negative five. Okay, so we've got a lot going on here. The first thing I wanna think about is which ones are these, what's a y value and what's an x value here? So when they talk about one less than p less than three, such that h of p equals negative five, the p's are your independent variable or what we usually use x for. So one to three is your x interval and they want to, us to explain why there's a value h of p that equals negative five in between one and three. So they don't even tell you that you're supposed to use the mean value theorem. You're just supposed to infer that um, from this problem. Um, first part of the mean value theorem is that the function needs to be continuous. And if f and g are both continuous when you compose f and g, if you have a composite function, it will also be continuous. So h of x is continuous. And the first step, or the next step, in using the intermediate value theorem is to find the y values of those two endpoints. So I need to find h of one and h of three. All right, so h of one is going to equal f of g of one minus eight and then I can get the values from the table. So g of one is two, so f of two minus eight, and f of two is nine, which equals one. So h of one equals one. And then I need to find h of three. All right, so my formula is h, h of three is going to be f of g of three minus eight. Okay, I'm working from the inside out, g of three is four. So f of four minus eight. And f of four is negative one. So negative one minus eight is negative nine. So I'm supposed to explain why there's a p value or an x value such that h of x equals negative five. And the reason is because this y value of negative five falls in between the two y values of my endpoints. And when I write that, and I, the way I write that is that negative five is between these two values. Well, negative nine is the smaller one. So I wanna say that h of three is less than negative five is less than h of one. So because negative five is between h of three and h of one, there must be an h of p equal to negative five for the interval between one and three. Um, it's not, you do need to show all of this work. It's not good enough to just think, oh, this is the intermediate value theorem. I just need to say that negative five is between those two endpoints. I do want you to find these actual values of h of one and h of three. Um, but when, so you need to show that, but when you're writing this line right here, I do want you to use the function notation because it's, it's just by glancing at it, you can s see that, oh, well, what this means is that negative five is between the y values that correspond to the two x values, one and three. So I want you to write it like this, please.